let's take a look at the impact of global business. Global business is the buying and selling of goods and services by people from different countries. Global business presents its own set of challenges for managers. How can you be sure that the way you run your business in one country is the right way to run it in another? Multinational corporations, known as MNCs, are corporations that own businesses in two or more countries. Direct foreign investment occurs when a company builds a new business or buys an existing business in a foreign country. Of course, companies from many other countries also own businesses in the United States. But direct foreign investment in the United States is only half the picture. U.S. companies also have made large direct foreign investments in countries throughout the world. U.S. companies have made their largest direct foreign investments in the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, Luxembourg, Canada, and Ireland. Overall, U.S. companies invest more than $4.9 trillion a year to do business in other countries. Historically, governments have actively used trade barriers to make it much more expensive or difficult, or sometimes impossible, for customers to buy or consume imported goods. Protectionism is a government's use of trade barriers to shield domestic companies and their workers from foreign competition. Governments have used two general kinds of trade barriers, tariff and non-tariff barriers. A tariff is a direct tax imposed on imported goods. Tariffs increase the cost of imported goods relative to that of domestic goods. An Argentinian import tax on electric products is 35%, for example. Non-tariff barriers are non-tax methods of increasing the cost or reducing the volume of imported goods. There are five types of non-type barriers, quotas, voluntary export restraints, government import standards, government subsidies, and customs valuation and classification. Because there are so many different kinds of non-tariff barriers, there can be even more potent method of shielding domestic industries from foreign competition. Quotas are specific limits on the number or volume of imported products. For example, the Chinese government only allows 34 imported movies per year. Like quotas, voluntary export restraints limit the amount of a product that can be imported annually. The difference is that the exporting country, rather than the importing country, imposes restraints. Usually, however, the voluntary offer to limit export occurs because the importing country has implicitly threatened to impose quotas. Government import standards are ostensibly established to protect the health and safety of citizens, but in reality are often used to restrict imports. Many nations also use subsidies, such as long-term, low-interest loans, cash grants, and tax deferments to develop and protect companies in special industries. The last type of non-tariff barrier is customs classification. As products are imported into a country, they're examined by custom agents who must decide which of nearly 9,000 categories they should be classified. The most significant change was that 124 countries agreed to adopt the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade known as the GATT. GATT, or the GATT, which existed from 1947 to 1995, was an agreement to regulate trade among eventually more than 120 countries, the purpose of which was substantial reduction of tariffs and other trade barriers and the elimination of preferences. GATT members engaged in eight rounds of trade negotiations, with the Uruguay Round signed in 1994 and going into effect in 1995. Although GATT itself was replaced by the World Trade Organization, WTO, in 1995, the changes that it made continue to encourage international trade. Today, the WTO and its member countries are negotiating what's known as the Dollar Round, which seeks to advance trade opportunities for developing countries in areas ranging from agriculture to services to, of intellectual property rights. 
The WTO, headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland, administers trade agreements, provides a forum for trade organizations, handles trade disputes, monitors national trade policies, and offers technical assistance and training for developing countries for its 164 member countries. Protection of intellectual property has become an increasingly important issue in global trade because of widespread product piracy. Product piracy is also costly to the movie industry, as movie studios and theaters, as well as video or DVD distributors, lose $18 billion each year to pirates. Finally, trade disputes between countries are now fully settled by arbitration panels from the WTO. In the past, countries could use their veto power to cancel a panel's decision. The second major development that has reduced trade barriers has been the creation of regional trading zones or zones in which tariff and non-tariff barriers are reduced or eliminated for countries within the trading zone. The largest and most important trading zones are the African Free Trade Zone Agreement, the Asia-Pacific Economic Corporation, the Central North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, and the Union of South American Nations. In 1992, Belgium, Denmark, France, Germany, Greece, Ireland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Portugal, Spain, and the United Kingdom adopted the Maastricht Treaty of Europe. The purpose of this treaty was to transform their 12 different economies and 12 currencies into one common economic market called the European Union or EU with one common currency. NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement among the United States, Canada, and Mexico went into effect on January 1, 1994. More than any other regional trade agreement, NAFTA has liberalized trade between countries so that businesses can plan for one market, North America, rather than three separate markets. One of NAFTA's most important achievements was to eliminate most product tariffs and prevent the three countries from increasing existing tariffs or introducing new ones. Overall, Mexican and Canadian exports to the United States are up 637% and 151% respectively since NAFTA went into effect. U.S. exports to Mexico and Canada are up 455% and 166%, growing twice as fast as U.S. exports to any other part of the world. In fact, Mexico and Canada now account for 34% of all U.S. exports. When companies produce products in their home countries and sell those products to customers in foreign countries, they're exporting. Exporting is a form of global business and offers many advantages. It makes the company less dependent on sales in the home market and provides a greater degree of control over research, design, and production decisions. Though advantageous in a number of ways, exporting also has disadvantages. The primary disadvantage is that exported goods are subject to tariff and non-tariff barriers and can substantially increase the final cost to customers. The second disadvantage is that transportation costs can significantly increase the price of an exported product. When an organization wants to expand its business globally without making a large financial commitment to do so, it may sign a cooperative contract with a foreign business owner who pays the company a fee for the right to conduct that business in his or her country. There are two kinds of cooperative contracts, licensing and franchising. Under a licensing agreement, a domestic company, the licensor, receives royalty payments for allowing another company, the licensee, to produce its product, sell its service, or use its brand name in a particular foreign market. A franchise is a collection of networked firms in which the manufacturer or marketer of a product or service, the franchisor, license the entire business to another person or organization, the franchisee. Franchisors provide franchisees with training, assistance with marketing and advertising, and an exclusive right to conduct business in a particular location. Companies forming strategic alliances combine key resources, costs, risks, technology, and people. The most common strategic alliance is a joint venture, which occurs when two existing companies collaborate to form a third company. 
the two founding companies remain intact and unchanged, except that together they now own a newly created joint venture. Approximately one-third of multinational companies enter foreign markets through wholly owned affiliates. Companies used to evolve slowly from small operations selling in their home markets to large businesses selling in foreign markets. Furthermore, as companies went global, they usually followed the phased model of globalization. Recently, however, three trends have combined to allow companies to skip the phased model when going global. First, quick, reliable air travel can transport people to nearly any point in the world within a day. Second, Low-cost communication strategies such as email, teleconferencing, and phone conferencing via the internet and cloud computing make it easier to communicate with global customers, suppliers, managers, and employees. Third, there's now a critical mass of business people with extensive personal experience in all aspects of global business. This combination of developments has made it possible to start companies that are global from inception. With sales, employees, and financing in different countries, global new ventures are companies that are founded with an active strategy. The most important factor in an attractive business climate is access to a growing market. Two factors help companies determine the growth potential of foreign markets, purchasing power and foreign competitors. Purchasing power is measured by comparing the relative cost of a standard set of goods and services in different countries. The second part of assessing the growth potential of global markets involves analyzing the degree of global competition, which is determined by the number and quality of companies that already compete in a foreign market. Companies do not have to establish an office or manufacturing location in each country they enter. They can license, franchise, or export to foreign markets, or they can serve a larger region from one country. But there are many reasons why a company might choose to establish a location in a foreign country. These criteria for choosing an office or manufacturing location are different from the criteria for entering a foreign market. Rather than focusing on costs alone, companies should consider both qualitative and quantitative factors. The two key qualitative factors are workforce quality and company strategy. A company's strategy is also important when choosing a location. Quantitative factors such as the kind of facility being built, tariff and non-tariff barriers, exchange rates, and transportation and labor costs should also be considered when choosing an office or manufacturing location. When managers think about political risk in global business, they envision burning factories and riots in the streets. Although political events such as these receive dramatic and extended coverage in the media, the political risks that most companies face usually are not covered as breaking stories on Fox News or CNN. Nonetheless, the negative consequences of ordinary political risk can be just as devastating to companies that fail to identify and minimize that risk. When conducting global business, companies should attempt to identify two types of political risk, political uncertainty and policy uncertainty. Political uncertainty is associated with the risk of major changes in political regimes that can result from war, revolution, death of political leaders, social unrest, or other influential events. Policy uncertainty refers to the risk associated with changes in laws and government policies that directly affect the way foreign companies conduct business. Political uncertainty is the most common and perhaps the most frustrating form of political risk in global business, especially when changes in laws and government policies directly undercut sizable investments made by foreign companies. Several strategies can be used to minimize or adapt to the political risk inherent in global business. National culture is the set of shared values and belief that affects the perceptions, decisions, and behavior of people from a particular country. Garrett Hofstede spent 20 years studying cultural differences in 53 different countries. His research shows that there are six constant cultural dimensions across countries power distance, individualism, masculinity, uncertainty avoidance, short-term versus long-term orientation, and indulgence versus restraint. 
Power distance is the extent to which people in a country accept that power is distributed unequally in society and organizations. In countries where power distance is weak, such as Denmark and Sweden, employees don't like their organization or their boss to have power over them or tell them what to do. They want to have a say in decisions that affect them. Individualism is the degree to which societies believe that individuals should be self-sufficient. In individualistic societies, employees put loyalty to themselves first and loyalty to their company and work group second. Masculinity and femininity capture the difference between highly assertive and highly maturing cultures. Masculine cultures emphasize assertiveness, competition, material success, and achievement whereas feminine cultures emphasize the importance of relationships, modesty, caring for the weak, and quality of life. The cultural difference of uncertainty avoidance is the degree to which people in a country are uncomfortable with unstructured, ambiguous, unpredictable situations. In countries with strong uncertainty avoidance, such as Greece and Portugal, people tend to be less aggressive and emotional and seek security rather than uncertainty. The cultural dimension of short-term, long-term orientation addresses whether cultures are oriented to the present and seek immediate gratification or to the future and defer gratification. Not surprisingly, countries with short-term orientations are consumer-driven, whereas countries with long-term orientations are savings-driven. Cultural differences affect perceptions, understanding, and behavior. Recognizing cultural differences is critical to successful global business. Nevertheless, as Hofsted pointed out, descriptions of cultural differences are based on averages, the average level of uncertainty avoidance in Portugal, the average level of power distance in Argentina, and so forth. Accordingly, says Hofsted, if you're going to spend time with a Japanese colleague, you shouldn't assume that overall cultural statements about Japanese society automatically apply to this person. Similarly, cultural beliefs may differ significantly from one part of a country to another. After becoming more aware of cultural differences, the second step is deciding how to adapt your company to those differences. Unfortunately, studies investigating the effects of cultural differences on management practices point more to difficulties than they do easy solutions. Another difficulty is that cultural values are changing, albeit slowly, in many parts of the world. An expatriate is someone who lives and works outside his or her native country. Expatriates who receive pre-departure language and cross-cultural training make faster adjustments to foreign cultures and perform better on their international assignments. Unfortunately, only a third of managers who go on international assignments are offered any kind of pre-departure training, and only half of those actually participate in the training. Documentary training focuses on identifying specific critical differences between cultures. After learning specific critical differences through documentary training, trainees can participate in cultural simulations in which they practice adapting to cultural differences. Finally, field simulation training, a technique made popular by the U.S. Peace Corps, places trainees in an ethnic neighborhood for three to four hours to talk to residents about cultural differences.